thanks, Mark. Um, well, first, I just want to say it's, it's an honor uh, to be here talking to all of you this morning, and, and it's really great to see such a vibrant uh, and uh, dynamic group. Uh, I, I must say, I was at last month. How many people were at last month's presentation? Yeah, it was great. And um, it was interesting um, because it really it, it impacted what I'm going to talk about today. I was really impressed with the positivity in the group, in the crowd, and just, just the energy. I think it's a really good sign of, 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 uh, of, of the health of the creative industry in, in Vancouver. However, I was a bit surprised um, that I didn't see many architects in, in the, are there any architects here today or graduate architects or, so we have one, two, a couple, three. Um, and I, it's interesting, I was having this conversation with Mark just in terms of, I'm not sure what that tells us, um, because, and, and perhaps it, it, it's a whole other talk, it'd be another, another talk just about maybe the siloization of creative communities. Um, and so this is a very different group than what I'm used to speaking to. Um, so it'll be interesting how you, how you, um, if you're interested in hearing what I have to say. Um, anyways, last last month Bob talked about fishing, and it was uh, it was really it was really great. It was really interesting. Now, architects. There we go. Architects have fish stories as well. Um, usually it comes down to Frank Geary and his fish and his propensity to design buildings like fish. Um, but it was, it was interesting listening to Bob because what, what I realized was that what his message and mine are actually quite similar. And, and what I took from, from, from him was this notion that things aren't always what they appear. And, and you find creativity and you find uh, things in un unexpected places. And, and so really what I'm talking about is quite, quite similar to that. So first of all, a little bit about, a little bit about me. Um, uh, I consider myself to be the luckiest person in, in the world, really. Um, I get to design places like this. I get to work for communities and design public spaces and public buildings, community centers, aquatic centers, and it's a really, really rich and satisfying uh, body of work to, to be working with communities and have such direct impact. So I get to do things like this and, and like this. And I get to design spaces that start out like this and end up like this. And it's, it's a real honor to work with, with communities and, and to make, it, make an impact in our, in our communities. Another thing about me is, is uh, I really think I'm an optimist. I'm a glass, I see a glass half full. Um, and so I really do um, see a lot of potential and a lot of positive uh, out, of, out of what I'll be talking about. So a little bit about what, what is motivating me and what, what is influencing uh, our work at the moment. I'm going to go back and talk about the history of architecture. Um, some of you may have studied a little bit of architecture, but I do it a little bit quicker. Um, <laughs> my view is that the first architectural act was rolling stones together and creating a fire. Uh, at its essence, architecture is a social art. It, it's, it's creating spaces where people come together, share stories, support each other, and and, and build, build a community. And really every architectural act um, comes down to this, to this simple, simple uh, issue for me. I think it reached its highest form uh, in, in the Renaissance and in spaces like this in Siena where, where you get the public square, which, which is a truly, uh, the square is more important than the buildings. It's the space where people congregate, it's where they do commerce, it's where they, uh, you know, have trials. It's where they, you know, it's where they celebrate. It, it, it is the living room of, of the community. And too often, what we've become is is we've we've given up our public space and ownership of our public space to the private sector. And you know, the shopping mall has created has become the the sort of pseudo public space that has has taken a lot of those roles and yet it really is not a public space you know not everyone is welcome you're welcome as long as you 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 fit a certain set of rules and certain set of guidelines that that are are, are suitable to this type type of space so i think we need to get back to the former i think we need to get back to creating spaces that are truly democratic and truly inclusive and allow for all all areas of our of our uh, communities 
Another area of uh, focus for, I think, a lot of us in our work is, is sustainability. Um, and I'm actually not a big fan of the word sustainability, and I think a lot of people are, are losing interest in that as a term. And I, I'm much more of a fan of, 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 of talking about resilience and, and how, to, how to find ways to, to make our communities more responsive to change and, and responsive to supporting one another. But using, using sustainability for the time being, it's often described as a, as a three-legged uh, stool. And uh, really what that is, is, is a blending of, of environmental, economic, and social strategies that are really based around creating a more resilient uh, community, both locally and, and globally. So from an architectural perspective, most, most work, and, and from planning an architectural perspective, most work uh, deals with the environmental aspects of, of sustainability. And most of, most of the energy that, that, that has gotten us to today uh, it touches on the economic and the social, but it's really focused on, on, on the environmental. And we have, in my world, a lot, of, uh, a lot of ways that have given structure and helped educate and transform the market. Uh, and, and you may have heard of LEAD, uh, Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. It's certainly one of the most dominant uh, building certification systems in, in North America and elsewhere. Um, but there's others as well that really try to bring structure to, to, to the discussion. One of my particular interests in design is, is looking at, at the cross-pollination between design disciplines. And that's part of the reason why I, I made the comment earlier about uh, the number of architects uh, in the room, because I really believe that we have a lot to learn from each other. And there's a lot uh, of, of um, things that are being explored and dealt with in different design disciplines that, that can inform uh, our work. And, and one, of the one of the things that really got me thinking about this was uh, we were doing the Whistler Library project and I was introduced to a, a, um, a designer who was working uh, north of Pemberton. Um, and he's a designer that uh, does, uh, he designs clothing and gloves and backpacks and things for the sort of outdoor apparel industry. And uh, we started this discussion and it was really quite fascinating to see his process. He set up a shop in, in the woods uh, north of Pemberton where he prototypes and where he experiments and where he's developing different ways of constructing garments. And I became quite fascinated by this because I saw a lot of architectural potential in, in, this, in this collaboration and these types of looking at different ways in different sectors. And so one of the things I did was I started attending conferences that weren't architectural conferences. And one of the ones I attended uh, was the Design Currency, the Design Week. Uh, event that was here in Vancouver a couple of years ago. Some of you may have, have attended that. Uh, it was really quite fascinating as sort of an outsider, uh, you know, squatting in, in, in a room full of, of communication designers and, and looking at and listening to what people were interested in, listening to what concerned people and what, was, what they were facing. And, and what struck me was that um, the the language and the discussions, are, particularly around sustainability, were almost identical, yet the subject matter was completely different. And, 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 and I think it just proved my point that we're all grappling with the same types of issues, but we're maybe too often doing them in silos. And that's why I think events like this are really wonderful to, to encourage greater cross-dialogue amongst design disciplines. But it was also important to me on another, another level. There was a really inspirational uh, presentation by Cameron Sinclair who's uh, a part of Architecture for, for Humanity. And he gave a very inspirational talk about the, the power of, of design and the power of architecture to um, change and, and to make real difference, differences to people. And uh, so it was really inspirational on another number of levels. But after he spoke, um, it was a question, you know, the typical question and answer period. And a fellow got up, uh, and he was from India. And uh, he asked a question, and he, he, he started the question by saying, and I'm, it's been a couple of years, my, I can't remember exactly what he said, but essentially what he, what he, what he said is, this is th what I took from it was this, this is all fine, but I'm from India, and in India, what's facing us is an emerging middle class, and over the next 20 to 30 years, there'll be 500 million new automobiles entering into the system. And the room kind of went dead. You know, it, it became this, and it was really staggering. It was a staggering statistic to be confronted with, with the scale of problems that others are dealing with. And, and, and you, you, you became, you, you realized the luxury of the challenges that we're dealing with. Um, but it really started, started me thinking 
about what that meant for us in, in our work. And um, this is a really simplistic analysis, um, so I'm warning you that, I'm telling you that in advance, but it does, it does, it is important. So one of the things we do is we do a lot of research around issues in sustainability, and so I had our uh, researcher um, do some, some, some digging into this, into this issue of the 500 million automobiles. Uh, I can't even barely say that. 500 million automobiles is, is just a staggering number of, of new, new vehicles. So we all know, you know, Canada is a big country with a small population. India's got a 1.2 billion uh, person population. Um, recently, CO2 emissions and megatons, you know, they're about, about three times what, what we are. Um, but per capita, we're 16.3 megatons per capita per year, they're 1.5. So we're about 10 times the emissions of India. And so when you start thinking about the, the change to the emerging middle class in, the, in, in countries like India, it, it really opens your eyes to, to a much broader problem. I'm not, I don't want to pick on India because I think this, this and this really isn't about India, it's, it's about us, but the, the story could be told about a number of different, but the example that was given to us in that, in that session was, was India. So um, Canada is the nice little red, the red sliver, we're about 2% of the world's emissions. India is about, um, it's, the, it's the purple, it's about 5% uh, currently. So we did some digging into this, this issue of the numbers of automobiles and currently there's 30 million automobiles in, in Canada and about 72 million in India. And I haven't been able to find that 500 million automobile statistic. The, the World Bank estimates it's closer to a 200 uh, million automobile uh, increase over the next 30 years. So I'm, I use that in my, in my analysis and it's still a, obviously a staggering number. You think we have 30 million and then we'll have 275 million by 2040. So, you know, it really puts into, into context the, the challenge that, that they face, but also uh, what we face uh, as a result. So we did this really, again, simplistic analysis, um, but the long and the short of it is, is that if they're entering the system at a constant rate, it's essentially one new car entering the system every five seconds. Now, bringing it back to our context, you know, we're really proud of our work and the work we've done around sustainable design, and uh, there's a lot to celebrate. However, when we look at our greenhouse gas reductions, one of our recent LEED Gold projects saves 4.5 megajoules of CO2 per year, and this is, sounds very impressive and, you know, uh, you know, took four years of hard work by a lot of people to achieve that, that level of success. Um, but that translate the offset of that is, is every eight minutes, that is offset by the new automobiles that are they're entering into the, the system in, in India. So basically in the time I've been speaking, four years of efforts at reducing greenhouse gas emissions from, a, from one project have, have been offset. And so it, it really, it really, uh, it really got us thinking when we look at this, well, what, is, what does this mean for us? You know, uh, Obviously, what we're doing around sustainable design and the efforts we're putting are really significant, uh, and, and we need to continue to do them. But for us, what it's really meant is that we really need to uh, challenge some of the assumptions we've made around sustainable design and make sure we're actually having the most significant and greatest impact we can have on, on our communities. And with all due respects to Buckminster Fuller, we, we do not live in a bubble. And so what, what we... Uh, do uh, and what's done elsewhere, we, we're affected by. And, you know, as an architect, we like to think that our buildings um, make a big difference, and, and they really do on lots of different levels. But the big challenge we face as a society is the transformation of the suburb. And, you know, the, the, uh, the trophy buildings that, that we build and other, other people build in, in public buildings and central areas of cities like Vancouver are really meaningful in terms of, of setting new ways and learning different ways and, and, and helping to transform. But until we actually find a way to transform what 99% of the built fabric is uh, in North America and elsewhere, we really aren't going to, to really deal with, with, with the issues. So. Changing direction slightly, um, you know, we're, we're, we're inundated with images and, and notions about sustainability, and it's, it's really become 
sort of background noise of 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 um, of what uh, and, and we, we start we start to believe the rhetoric we start to think insignificant things are significant or or, or at least give things greater meaning than perhaps we, we should this has been an uh, an image I love to love to show because um, you know really the solution is not adding fancy technologies and different systems to buildings that are fundamentally unsustainable. We need to find ways to do things that are simpler and, and, and get down to, down to fundamental principles. Um, I refer to this as, as sort of a trinket architecture and, and there's too much of that frankly, that just simply adding, adding a trinket to a building to call it sustainable is not, is not in, in its necessarily uh, sustainable on, a, on its own right. So we need to be more critical, all of us in our work, we need to be more critical about what we're saying. And we actually have, need to live up to the rhetoric that we're, that we're talking about when we're talking about sustainability. So some of the things, and as I said, we're, we're confronted with these things every day. And I was recently in a, in a hotel in Edmonton and I went to have a shower in the morning and this is what I was confronted with. And I thought like, this is real. Like, why do I? Why could I possibly need two shower heads? This is to me. This is this truly is greenwashing. Um, and this was what they told me before I hopped in the shower that you know through the shower I could both refresh myself and and restore our world. I thought, wow, isn't that great? You know, isn't that great? You know, I turn off one of the shower heads and I can save the world. <laughs> it, you know, it, it it just started my day beautifully. But but these things are around us around us uh, all the time. Um, actually, after, after I, I walked away from the last session and I, and I, I had lunch and I sat down and, and, I, and I grabbed a napkin and, and it said, save the environment one napkin at a time. And I thought, well, this is great. So I took two because clearly <laughs> two is better than one. You know, so we, we need to be more critical of, of some, of these, some of these messages that, that were given. And this is one of my particular uh, peeves. Um, I think we need to move beyond sort of preaching to people about how to be sustainable and actually move to solutions that are truly uh, more, uh, more helpful. So again, what does this mean for, uh, for me and our work and my firm and, and, and our, our work? Well, our response to this and, and other issues is, is, is obviously to, well, maybe it's not obvious, but for us, we're, we're continuing to pursue uh, strategies and, and different ways of making our buildings as you know as environmentally uh, self-sufficient and um, you know, with the least impact as possible. So we're continuing to push into the environmental you know the environmental aspect. But for us, the social sustainability side of things is is the answer, and it's really becoming far. It's the area of research, it's the area of, of discussion that we believe as a firm we need to, we need to pursue a much more vigorous uh, discussion around social sustainability. It was great to see how many people were willing to volunteer this morning, uh, by the way, but I, I kind of wondered what about everybody else? You know, shouldn't, anyways. Um, so for us, it's, we're, we're, we consider ourselves in the community building business. Uh, our media is architecture and, and buildings, but r we really look for every opportunity within, within what we do to, um, to help build, build a stronger community. It's interesting because obviously we're not the only ones that have come to this, this conclusion. Um, I received this in my inbox the other day from Starbucks and, and really what, what they're doing with this community building initiatives is really what I'm talking about, is there's not a single word in this message around, around environment. Um, and around uh, other sustainability aspects, but it's really about building community. And I think that's really great. I think we need, we need to look for these, these opportunities of, of ways to, uh, that we can build a stronger community. But again, back to, back to creativity and, and what we do in our work. Uh, and this is by no means exhaustive, and, and for us it's an evolving, an evolving uh, effort. But we, we focus on, on the following things. And the first thing I'm gonna talk about is, is social spaces. Uh, I call them the glue spaces. Um, when, we, when we do a building, um, it's filled with program spaces and there's a lot of effort going into making the rooms themselves as functional as possible. 
but too often there's not enough effort that goes into the spaces that hold them together. It's, it's the social, it's the spaces between the program spaces where, where community is built and where people run into their neighbors, where they sit and read a book, where they have an argument, where, where they do all the things that are important in, in, healthy, in healthy communities. So we put a lot of effort into creating a variety of, of social spaces that support, support community interaction. We also believe and, and, and look for opportunities to create a diversity of spaces. One of the things that's really important to us is, is ensuring that, or looking for ways to, to send subtle messages to people about the diversity in a community. And there's lots of different ways that this can be done um, if, if you're looking for those opportunities. But we really need to celebrate our differences and you need to be exposed to them. And I think in our community facilities, it's truly a, it's a great place to be exposed to, um, to differences as well as, as commonalities. We need to create spaces that are truly democratic. And I mentioned earlier the, in the history of architecture that we've given up a lot of our of our democratic spaces to the, to the to the private sector, and that's really sad. We need spaces where we can argue. We need spaces where we can celebrate. We need spaces where we can come together, where everyone in, in the community is welcome, regardless of 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 you know age, race, ability, uh, mental condition, you name it. You know, everyone everyone needs to be to be welcome, and and part of that is is creating inclusive spaces and I use this image from the Whistler Library because it's a great story. Um, Whistler in itself is filled with with contradictions but uh, the library is a really important social space in 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 the community and um, we have these wonderful study carols where people can where, can read a book but um, there's a homeless person in in Whistler who um, this fellow who used to live underneath the library the old library and, um, you know, not sure of his full story, what sort of history, what's brought him to, to this place, but what I do know is that every day when the library opens, he comes in, sits down in a chair, has a nap, does whatever he does, basically uses the building as, 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 as his home. He's welcome, and that's, and that's fine, and that is exactly what we need to see. We need to see these types of spaces where, where all are welcome. An, an important part of inclusivity is accessibility. And this is an area of, uh, I could give a whole talk on accessibility uh, as well. But um, this is my bank. Uh, this is, I live in Deep Cove, and this is the Deep Cove Royal Bank. You know, unremarkable. It's like every bank that we all probably exist. And I've been using this branch for the last close to 20 years. And uh, a few months ago, I was, I was standing in line, and I was looking at the, the, the teller machines. And I thought, that's really curious. One's got a... A, uh, a little wheelchair sign above above the the teller machine. I thought, well, how come I haven't noticed that that before? And, and I looked more carefully, and I realized that the only difference between these two teller machines is that one is set two inches lower than the other. And I'm sure it meets every code, and 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 that's that's wonderful. But why don't we just set all of them two inches lower, and so make the entire community accessible? You know, we, these are. These are really simple principles. You know, it's not that hard. You know, put them all lower, take the little sign off, and make everybody welcome. You know, it, 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 it's all about attitude. And, and I'll, I'll diverge for a second. You know, as a young architect, I got involved in a, one of my first community projects in the Lower Mainland was a um, aquatic center in Langley. And I was really proud. I worked really hard. I put blood, sweat, and tears into this into this project. And and we we followed all the codes. And we had we, we got advice from all sorts of sources, particularly around sustainability or accessibility. And uh, I remember shortly after the project opened, I received a letter. This was before before email. And I received a letter from from a mother who um, who said. Uh, well, this is kind of an emotional story. She she said, "This is great. I love the facility. It's wonderful on so many levels." But I can't bring my daughter, and she had a particular disability uh, that made it that she couldn't use the facility. Now, at the time, I just had a daughter, and so it really it really hit me, and that's why it's emotional for me, because we we thought we were doing everything we could. This was wonderful. We were we were making this this community facility, and and here it was through simple simple action we could have actually made it accessible for more. And so, from from that point forward, we've really tried to push push far beyond. Um, the codes. So, enough of that. So we, 
part of we also need joy and beauty we need spaces that that inspire and that are experiential and that create these these things that we feel proud of we need spaces that are healthy um, that don't don't pollute that 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 uh, create environments where, where people uh, uh, don't don't make people sick we also need spaces where where we can celebrate where we can we can come together as communities and really share share joy so I'm going to talk briefly about one of our recent projects how am I doing for time I'm close okay Jasper Place Library is a project we're currently doing in Edmonton, and it's under it's under construction. But it is a it is a branch library, typical branch library program, but not a typical branch library form. And so this was interesting because what we the discussion we started with the library was about what is the li what is a library that has no books? Because we know that within the lifespan of this building, there won't be any books in this in this building. The um, and this, this, this was really an interesting, interesting discussion because it really became about the social spaces. And so what we designed was a, a space where it's, it's, a, it's a large open space that is focused on the social spaces and the, and the collection really needs to have to adapt within it. And it also creates a very strong and bold and exciting, I think, dramatic form uh, within, within the community. But the focus is on the social spaces because we know that's what will remain and that's what the community really needs. So, what inspires me? <laughs> Norway inspires me. Um, there's wonderful spaces. I think they have a really good attitude about public space. Uh, the new, new opera house, I think, shows a really wonderful way of engaging the water. But I want to talk a little bit about the national tourist route program in Norway um, because here's where we've mixed design and social sustainability in a unique way. Norway um, is littered with with these wonderful roads through through desolate and beautiful landscapes and they recognize the potential to create um, to revitalize these 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 roads through through design and through architecture and so they created uh, competitions and different ways of of experiencing them and it has resulted in some truly wonderful wonderful design where people are really their relationship with nature and and is is heightened and um, and so they've created all of these series of rest stops along these roads and what it's done is it's created community it's created uh, economy uh, hotels have sprung up old hotels now have business communities that are were bypassed by tunnels now have have business and it really is, is a really uh, wonderful way of, of uh, connecting with, with nature. It's resulted in some tremendous design. This is a, a reindeer viewing gallery in northern Norway by Snoheda um, that has recently received quite a bit of press. And it really is a wonderful uh, type of space. Uh, another recent project um, for a viewing gallery on the side of a waterfall. And so you can see the power of of, of design to actually change the way we, we understand uh, a landscape. And when you contrast this to the discussion that we've had recently in Canada about the viewing platform that's been proposed in, 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 uh, in Jasper Park, uh, you really see that they, they have a much more mature understanding of their relationship with nature than we do. And we could really learn a lot from, from, uh, from Norway. Almost done. Final question. What can you do to help build a stronger community? Uh, as I think ultimately we, we all have a responsibility and it's really what's gonna make us uh, uh, resilient in the face of, of change, in the face of things that we can't control. We need to do it in our personal lives but we really need to do it in our professional lives and in our work because that's, that's where we really can have a very, very significant uh, impact. Oh, oh. Thank you. We're, um, we're a few, minute, few minutes behind schedule, so let's, um, let's get going with this. Daryl, if Daryl could join me back on stage, we're going, to, um, we're going to hammer him with the hard stuff. Peace, man. Peace out. Uh, I'll start. I'll start with a question. You talk about um, community. 
and uh, sustainability and how those are actually more, more connected than, than many have, have realized in the past. Why hasn't community been better, you know, more a part of that process? And what can we do about it now? Like, what's, what are the, what are the, how do you, how do you get that aspect, how that message up to the powers that be and make this a part of the process? Well, it's a, it's a really good question. I think the, um, I think part of the reason is it's really hard to measure. You know, we focused on the things that we can, we can, we can meter or we can test. Um, how do you measure the level of social engagement in a community? And, and your impact on it. They're, they're longer term, they're harder to quantify. And so I think for a lot of good reasons, I think the focus has been on the things that are easier to, to quantify. And I think what we really need to do is research around the things that are more difficult. So I think we've, we've uh, you know, an often used term in sustainability is low hanging fruit. We've, I think we're getting good at the low hanging fruit. Um, now we need to really push ourselves and challenge ourselves at the things that are harder to, harder to quantify and harder to understand. Do you? Gag uh, uh, Creative Mornings alumni, Gag and Diesch. Um, my, stand up. Stand up. Very tight jeans. Um, <laughs> my question actually was around the slide that you had around diversity. How do you see architecture promoting diversity? That, I'm glad you asked that. That's a great, great question because it, it's not immediately apparent how, how you can, how you can uh, uh, but I think that the more we're exposed to different, I, I do a lot of community centers, so in my context, what I can do is make sure people are aware of the diversity of activities that are, that are taking place and leave it up to the people programming the facilities to allow for the, the, the spectrum of the community to exist. But if you're exposed to it, I believe that just simply being exposed to it and seeing it makes you more tolerant of it, makes you more understanding of it. Uh, so it's a subtle thing, it's a small thing, and it's obviously not going to lead to fundamental change, but we should be doing it. You know, because I think every, every small little thing makes a difference. So making sure when we're designing them as well that we're, we're talking to the widest range of the community so that we're getting, we're understanding if there are, you know, different programmatic needs or different social needs or different uh, cultural needs that we can incorporate into the work. So there's actually, when you actually start to, to dig into it, there's actually quite a few things that we do at a detail level that, that can just support to greater diversity. Yeah. Oh, 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 sorry. You're in charge. <laughs> when designing for um, projects, you're talking about physical um, inclusion. What about social inclusion? So when you're designing a space, um, what are you doing to uh, include sort of all the social aspects that are, um, you know, Transgender, for example, you know, just just including sort of that sort of in inclusion in the in the community. Well, um, it depends on the building type and and what we're doing. But like I said, in, in the context of community facilities and community centers and community uh, recreation type facilities that I do a lot of, um, a lot of it comes down to the uh, the attitude of the operator and and the philosophy. So we can set the table. For, for making sure that the, the infrastructure is there to allow for, for people, people to be dealt with in a, dig, in a dignified way. And so, um, you know, use, using your example, uh, it's, it's maybe a simple response, but, um, you know, if we have, uh, we use a concept called, in our aquatic facilities, for instance, that is, we call a universal change facilities where we focus less on gender specific changing and really much more about what people are asking for, which is, which is privacy. Um, and so we, we call them universal change rooms um, because they can accommodate anyone, right? And, and everyone equally. And, 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 that, and that's subtle, but really, really important. Um, but I, you know, there's lots of different, different examples. Um, it's just you know, keeping your mind open to the fact that, you know, Accessibility is an easy one because a lot of it is it, a lot of it is uh, quantifiable. But you know, we get these charts and templates about what a what a disabled person's needs are. And, you know, they're in a wheelchair and their arm reaches this far, and that's all great. But you know, that's what five percent of disabled people. So what about everybody else? So it's really it's really it's I think for us I think it's about having the attitude that that we're not looking at we're not looking at at 
at people as sort of in a narrow way and making sure we're open to as many different inputs and influences um, as, as we can uh, in our work. Hi, I got a microphone. Um, I'm Hillary. Mark asked me to introduce myself. I've been one of the organizers here for Creative Morning because this is my last month on that. Um, and thank you so much for your talk. We had a really great group discussion um, that focused around this sort of um, um, idea of like how we use spaces public, like as a community. And uh, for me, like I am a cyclist. I'm, you know, I, I'm a big walker. I'm very much about like you know personal accountability and about like if I want a city that's going to serve me and spaces that serve me, I have to take it, I have to create that, and uh, and I have to talk to people and make sure they understand what it is that I'm looking for just as much as everybody else's responsibility to do the same. So I'm wondering, like, what is a space in Vancouver that you see that it perhaps is like, when you go by it, you're like, oh, I would totally do this to this space, and how can we do that? How can we claim, we, how can we reclaim a private space and make it our own? Wow. Uh, where do I start? Well, there's lots of spaces that I'd love to get my hands on, but um, you know what? I, I'll, I'm not sure if it's going to directly answer your question, but I want to talk about it anyways. Because um, I, I think it does get to your point. I think it's our relationship to the water. And it, it's, it's, you know, we're so proud of the seawall and, and, you know, 40 kilometers of the same thing. And what's wrong with touching the water? You know, what's wrong with having spaces or buildings that actually cross the other side? Um, because the, the seawall is about moving. It's not about being, right? So we've actually created a barrier uh, to touch the water, engage with the water. And I think, I think we need more public space opportunities that change our relationship with the water. I, I showed the slide of the, the opera house in, in Norway. And I find it, I mean, it's an, it's an incredible public space. And if, if you ever have an opportunity to visit it, it's, it's one of the most incredible public spaces I've ever experienced. It was built around the same time as our convention center. And again, I don't want to pick on our convention center. I think there's lots of wonderful things um, a, a, about it. But it just demonstrates a very, very different approach and belief around what our relationship is to nature and to the water. And there, the building actually dives into the water and you can, you, the building is a, is a public is a public space. We we give we give um, our convention center is is about landscape. It's about nature. It's about the green roof, and and we're separated from the water. They're both you know tidal. They're both uh, you know built on on stilts in, in in the water. Yet one creates a, creates a really direct relationship with with the the the, the environment. Uh, that's completely un unrelated to the program. And it was a missed opportunity, I think, with, with a project like that. Um, and so I, I think it, what it really does demonstrate is that we have this obsession you know, with every last tree and with every uh, bit of nature, but we don't have enough hard surface public spaces where, where we can gather, where we can, you know, the, the, the best thing we have is in front of the, the art gallery. You know, and it's what bark mulch. Uh, you know, so you know when there's demonstrations, it doesn't affect the grass. Well, you know, we need spaces like that. We don't have enough of them. We give too many of our public spaces over to green, and um, we, you know, we're surrounded by it. You know, um, we we need more hard surface. We need more people spaces uh, as well. to go around the room. I, if there's a lot of people. I know everybody's caught my eye, but I'm trying to circulate, so I'm going to go back there. <clears throat> Hi. I uh, wanted to get your feedback on the recent discussions in Vancouver about the Georgia Viaduct and whether it should be uh, ripped down or do you see a potential for turning that into a, a usable um, green space, biking, walking, that sort of thing? Well, that, this, that's a really important question and I think it's one that it's one of the really important urban questions facing our city right now. So I have to first of all admit that I don't have a very well informed opinion. I haven't studied it, I haven't looked at the implications of tearing them down. Um, so it's more of a gut, a gut reaction and, and I guess in my mind, there's it's no question it, it's a barrier and, and that it, it, it's, it should be taken down. I think that, that it, it, 
we benefit more from from um, stitching together stitching together the community in a, in a more significant way. Um, but I, like I said, I don't I don't know the, don't know the implications of that. One of the things you hear about quite often, and there's so much talk about about the High Line Park in, in, in New York, which is a you know wonderful but unique situation, and I, I don't really buy that it could be that for us. I don't think the conditions are necessarily the same. So I, I you know, I'd rather I think for me I'd rather remove it than than you know transform it um, because I, as long as it's there, it'll always be a barrier. And the spaces underneath are, are really inhuman, you know, and so. Um, I'd, I'd rather have human spaces on the ground that stitch together a whole bunch of, of, of community than I would in having human spaces up in the air. Um, so, like I said, not very well informed, but that's just my own personal view right now on that issue. Some controversy. You all tweeting that? <laughs> Daryl Condon says, tear that sucker down. <laughs> Mo Daliwa. <laughs> Hi. Um, my question is, uh, I guess, a little bit about culture, because uh, a number of your slides touched on that. Uh, one of my colleagues is from South Africa, and I mean, you get a couple of beers into him, and he's always rallying at the fact that, or rallying against the city that uh, you can't drink in public spaces here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so a number of your slides showed some public spaces in Europe and elsewhere where you have this opportunity, this public space that's really, I think, has you know incredible potential to affect the culture of a space. But in Vancouver, I think there's some specific challenges around the culture of the city affecting the architecture. Um, so how do you get around that? Also another really good question. I, I'm not sure it's my area of expertise, um, but I do have an opinion. Um, <laughs> I think we are overregulated. You know, I think that we, we don't have enough, we don't give ourselves enough we don't trust ourselves enough, and and, and uh, you know, we haven't really. No, it's changing. I've, I mean, I've lived in Vancouver since 1993, so almost 20 years, and there's been a huge change in in the sort of energy on the street and the, uh, uh, the street culture. So I, I think everything's heading in the right direction, but I I don't think that we're we're nearly where where we need to be. We need to be open to to uh, taking. I mean, I hate to say it when, when, you know, a year after, I think we all showed we weren't very, uh, we weren't really able to be very responsible in our public spaces, but, um, so there's a, with a bit of irony, I guess, suggests that we need to take more risks and we need to, um, you know, just touching on that, I think it's so sad. Here was, a, you know, when it was positive, the, the public, the life on the street around, Vancouver last last spring was fantastic, and 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 uh, you know we experienced that during the Olympics as well. And it would be such a shame if, you know, in response to to what happened, that we would not give ourselves, not trust ourselves enough to to use our public spaces and our outdoor realm to live. You know, and and that that does concern me. It concerns me that we 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 would be moving moving away from that. Um, so I'm not sure if that directly answers your question or not, but uh, I, I mean I, I'm not an expert on on liquor regulations or bylaws or, um, but we need to, we do need to do more. You know we need we need to occupy our public spaces. We need to live in them. We need to, um, uh, you know we need to find lots of different ways to to uh, uh, bring life uh, and interact because ultimately that's what builds community. And, and for me, it, it always comes back to. To, to building a stronger community. And if we're all shut in our doors and, you know, tweeting away and doing whatever we do, um, you know, and it's interesting the, the library project that I, I touched on, and I could talk at length some of that, but one of the really interesting things about the library is that in spite of the fact that they're becoming less about the collections, their usage is actually increasing generally. And, you know, there's all kinds of theories about it, but for me, what it points out is that you know the social role, the social uh, needs of of the community aren't being well met. And the library, for instance, when you focus on the public space and the social spaces, uh, is is an ideal place for that. But our outdoor spaces should be uh, as well. I nobody asked me my opinion, but I would add that the afford the affordability one of the one of the cultural um, side effects of the affordability crisis we're having in our city is that we're ending up a you know a city that's only half occupied first of all and the culture creators who require 
affordable housing, those real neighborhoods made up of people like us, um, we're running out of those neighborhoods and we're, we're going to end up a city filled with douchebags. And that's going to that's gonna end up being our culture. And, you know, drinking in public because it's a bunch of douchebags, it's not going to work. Right? Anyway. <laughs> One day I'll be a speaker. I don't know. Well, again, I'm not sure it's, I just, I just want to comment briefly on that. Again, maybe not my area of expertise, but, but I mentioned the transformation of the suburbs. And, you know, um, there's so many things to celebrate about, about how we've transformed uh, downtown Vancouver in particular, and so many, so many good things. But until we open our minds to transforming the rest of the city and the rest of the cities that surround the city, um, we're going to have this challenge. I mean, we've pushed out all of the affordable housing. We're not willing to replace it. And, you know, um, you know, we, as a community, we need to decide to open ourselves up to, to living a little bit differently and ultimately to be living better. Uh, but people are afraid of that. They're afraid of the change. They, they, don't, they don't know the possibilities. Um, and so we get into these sort of nimbyism issues. Um, and, you know, we, 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 need, we all need to be advocates. We all need to be promoting positive change. Um, that's how I think we're going to deal with those, those issues. Okay, so you actually kind of just answered my question I, uh, it, I, about change. I'm Bob. I, I spoke at last month's uh, Creative Mornings. So um, I just recently moved into a lead building, and you know the the uh, our, our landlord told us, you know, you don't have absolute control over the heat. You just have like two degrees warmer than outside or two degrees colder than outside, and that's a compromise that we have to make. You know, we can't choose to have it 80 yeah. degrees in our house because that's how we save energy, right? And um, I just kind of wanted to know your feelings about if there's a way to make it easier for the for the residents of neighborhoods to to absorb density and you know specifically about what you just talked about about perceived nimbyism in, in our neighborhoods like is is there a way to inform or to to I don't know to, is that a question does that make sense <laughs> like how do we bridge that gap where there aren't people saying hey there shouldn't be a high rise in Mount Pleasant hey there should be a high rise in Mount Pleasant you know is there a Answer to that in, in a, well, you in know, a, if I had, I think if, if there was an easy answer to that. Talking about rise, aren't you? Yeah. yeah. You dirty bastard. <laughs> I think if there was an easy answer to that, um, um, I I don't know. Maybe I'd be speaking to a larger group. I don't know. Um, that's a uh, that's a really that's a difficult issue because we we are we do we I, I've been talking a lot today about the de democracy and the need. To celebrate our differences, the need to to, to argue, and the need to, to come to healthy healthy resolution. Um, so it's not that I don't understand or sympathetic to a, a diversity of viewpoints, but um, I don't know. I don't know how we overcome fear of change, um, because the one certainty is is change, and it's a cliche, but it is it is so true. Um, you know, unless we actually, you know, I live in North Vancouver and. District of North Vancouver. Uh, several years ago, there was there was a, a, a decision by the community that we didn't want to to flood, you know, to move up the mountains and fill it with single-family homes and to stop uh, growth. And that was a really well-intentioned uh, thing. I mean, nobody wants. I don't think we need to, you know, cut down any more trees on our local mountains and and build single-family houses. But the unintended consequences of that is that change happened. Uh, but it wasn't a change that we were in control of. And now what we see is that with no housing options, um, the demographic changes that are a result of, of that is that there's no families, there's no young kids, and the schools are closing. And so now you get into arguments in the community uh, about, well, we don't want our, our, our schools to close, but we're not willing to make the changes to our community that would actually set up the fundamental conditions where schools would stay open. Because we're, we're, our discussions are so emotional and they're so fragmented and we don't make linkages between a decision here that affects another aspect of our community. So we need to find a way to have more balanced and more comprehensive discussions and, and, and instead of just you know, uh, responding emotionally to issues to actually understand. And it's difficult, I, 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 don't, know, I don't have a good answer. I don't know how we, how we do that. Um, but I know that the more people that are out there advocating for positive change and for for, for more constructive discussion uh, in communities, the better off uh, I think we'll, we'll be in terms of reaching that. Um, 
we are literally out of time, so I want to ask you guys a question. Do we stop now, or do you want to do a couple more questions? Are you okay with another five, five minutes, ten minutes? I need to, I need to know, because if you need to go, my, my, my contract with you people is at 10 o'clock you go home. It's now 10 o'clock. So if anybody has to leave, please feel free to get to work. Um, we're going to do, let's do two more questions and then wrap up and go, shall we? Because I, I like this. Uh, okay, there's someone in, who works in architecture. Let's, maybe he's got a smart question. That's a lot to live up to. Um, I'm not an architect, so uh, bear with me here. Um, but the comments around uh, engagement and, um, you know, the traditional method to get a community to understand what's happening is to do flyers and advertisements and then have a four o'clock uh, meeting at City Hall where you get 50 people to show up and whoever gets the mic is usually the unhappiest person in the room. Not in this case, of course. So what, uh, what's your opinion on how things are going to move to the online space and engage things like social media where bigger, faster dialogues can happen um, and actually create a much more interesting, richer discussion where you can create those linkages between um, the complete view of the issue where um, there's situations happening over here and here and they're not connected because uh, I still see that movement kind of old school. So do you see that transitioning happening? And um, what's your opinion on the effectiveness of, of moving online with some good discussions around community development? You know, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, there's been lots, uh, lots of really interesting things happening around looking at different ways to consult, particularly around an architectural project. Um, we're doing it, others are doing it, looking at using social media as a way of getting a word out and getting information back in. And I think we're really in the infancy of understanding the power of that. And I think we haven't made all the mistakes yet. We haven't, you know, we're, st we're just learning h how best to, um, to get maximum impact from that. Um, it's really quite interesting when we, you know, our projects now, we'll set up a Facebook page and a Twitter account and we'll, uh, you know, you name it. And we'll, we'll look at ways of, of, of getting information out. And it's quite fascinating for us to see the types of responses we get. And uh, um, so I think it's going to be increasingly important uh, way of getting information out. Um, and then I think we need to start understanding how to filter that information, how to understand it. We're, you know, for years we've, we've built public buildings through consultation and we go out to public open house and we see people face to face and we, you understand where the comment's coming from. You, you understand if, even if the room's been filled by one point of view, because we, we, we really try to make sure in our, you know, and I think most architects do, is that you don't just listen to one voice, you listen to, to as many. And one of the things we're learning about social media is that it, it's, 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 it's faceless, right? And so you don't know if, um, if the, uh, the, the response is all coming from a special interest or particular, particular group. Um, we're doing a, a pool in uh, Surrey at the moment, and so we've got, um, uh, we did a parallel public open house and a parallel online survey and uh, it was really interesting to, to follow the, the, the numbers and to follow, look at how, how the responses came back in, both the timing uh, and, and the quantity. And we, we had far more comments back online than we did in public, which was interesting. Um, but we could also start seeing trends in terms of the demographic and special interest groups that would hit it at certain times. And you could surmise that somebody's, you know, sending a group email to everybody and, 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 and we're getting flooded with a particular point of view. Um, but then it became really interesting to study the in-person consultation and the online consultation and see where the differences were and where the similarities were. And uh, it, some of the things surprised us. So uh, I think it's going to become uh, increasingly important and I think we're all going to get better at understanding and interpreting uh, the data. Who's willing to uh, guarantee me that it is smoking awesome? You're on the committee, so I'm, I'm pulling your disqualified. I see a hand back here. You're swearing to me. You're giving me the eyeballs like it's so good, right? Aaron, you're out. Is it a good one? OK, so here's the deal I'm going to make with all of you guys. Everybody, I think this is a super important conversation. If I was, if I was John Stewart, it would be that moment in the show, on The Daily Show, where I'd say, can you stick around? We'll talk about it, and we'll put it on the web. So what I'd like to do is, I'm going to let Aaron ask one last question, because he's a special guest. He's come a long way. Everybody else that has a question, email it to Vancouver at creativemornings.com, and we will get them answered. Deal? We'll answer them? 
Maybe not by the end of the day. But Maybe not then. today. <laughs> and we'll publish them on the blog. Publish them on the, on the blog as a supplemental. Is that kind of cool? I just came up with that myself. Is that okay? okay. Aaron. Hi, hi, my name is Aaron James Drapple. I'm a graphic designer, and Mark made me ask this question, so I'm nervous talking in front of people. <laughs> but um, um, do you guys have a typographer on staff? Because, you know, where I'm from in northern Michigan, you know, they build these big, wild-ass things, and you go there, and it's hard to find the entrance, and it's cool, and there are these big, wild forms and all that stuff. And then the last step, the icing on the cake, was just bad typography that's going to last for 25 years. So. Why do architects think they're typographers? And, and thank you. <laughs> that is not the question I thought he was going to ask. <laughs> well, it's a great, it's a great question. Um. <laughs> Don't do it, Daryl. No, no. It's Don't say it. <laughs> I agree with you, by the way. I, I think, uh, I think uh, too many architects think they're typographers and graphic designers and, and, and other things. And I think it gets back to my, one of my earlier comments is that we need more cross-pollination and more discussion amongst design disciplines. Uh, and I think we'd all, but you know what? I could say, make the same question is because I've been in rooms full of other design disciplines and, and everybody's an architect as well. But, and I think, I think we need to understand each other's areas of expertise better um, and support one another because ultimately we all benefit from from promoting a stronger design culture uh, across across the board <laughs> sorry I just realized I forgot my thank you card for Daryl thank you very much well, thank you thank you stick with me for a second